Uh, I have to start on a slightly apologetic note this morning because I realized that I had this brilliant idea for reorganizing the syllabus slightly and just went ahead and did it, forgetting that telepathy doesn't work anymore now that they have the internet. So I slightly threw you a curve and uh, I badly messed up the webcast people. So what I'm going to do is r send you all through CourseWeb or whatever means you employ. A, uh, we have a one person Satyagraha against CourseWeb going on. A uh, new, a revised syllabus which will explain, explain what we're doing with this section of the course and I'll, I'll explain it to you verbally in a second and also we'll start to list the guest speakers because I'm going to, there's some really, really uh, wonderful people who can contribute to what we're doing. I'm going to be inviting them uh, aboard and I'll have information on when some of them will be pretty soon. So as you can probably see, what I did was the original syllabus for this topic, insurrectionary movements, spanned from the uh, Central American events that took place during World War II and then it came down to the Eastern European intifada or shaking off of Soviet communism in the late 80s. Um, <coughs> but there have been some new revolutions <laughs> since then and some new films. And so I, what I did was I skipped the film A Force More Powerful and I went immediately into the film that we were going to be doing in the third week which is Where There Is Hatred. So that's why we saw that and we are going to be talking about that film in about 10 or 20 minutes. But I, I want to now tell you a little bit. In other words, what happens is we now can come down to 2000 AD with the, the same kind of documentation. But we didn't have time for all the films that have come up. So I, I skipped that one. Um, and we will get back to that film where there is hatred in just a bit. But I wanted to mention to you what happens in A Force More Powerful why it's an important uh, PBS documentary. It was the first time, I believe, the first time ever that a Western audience, which probably means any audience, was exposed to public filmic material which explicitly was about nonviolence. Now their frame is a little bit different uh, from ours here, but the fact that they chose that title a force more powerful instead of, you know, what happens when you do nothing or, <laughs> <laughs> or political activism for wimps or something like that. That's a huge step forward because – well, let me, let me ask you by way of filling in the argument. Uh, we talked last time about one of the different approaches we would have from – different from what Gene Sharp was saying about these movements. What are maybe some of the other differences when he defines nonviolence? Did an antenna go up for you perhaps? Or some, some would say tilt because you're way too young to know about pinball machines. But <laughs> something tell you that, wait a second, this is not how Professor Nagler would define it. So what's going on here? How am I going to pass this course? You notice anything else? Yeah, Michael? He presented it as a strategy, of course, and in effect that means two things that are different from our approach. Again, this is not a right or wrong thing. These are just different ways of framing the topic. You probably noticed that he was concerned with one situation, namely overthrowing dictators. Now, in his personal life, that's not where Gene Sharp stands. I remember him telling a story about how his dog offered satyagraha against him one day when he was driving him around Boston. And those of you who have taken Pax 164A know that there is such a thing as canine satyagraha. Um, so it's not that he sees the world that way, but when he goes to define it, he chooses that rather narrow frame and something positive and something negative happens there. The positive thing is it attracts the attention of people who otherwise would be threatened. And the negative thing is it attracts the attention of people who otherwise would have been threatened. Ha, 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 ha. What do I, what do I mean by this? 
Um, I was working on the mostly student uh, uprisings in Kosovo around 1990. And those people, the Kosovar Albanians who were trying to shake off the oppression of the Serbian regime, were having remarkable successes. And they got support from the most unlikely people, people who I would consider politically conservative extremely conservative. And I asked a friend of mine who had been over there, what's their interest in all of this? And they said, oh, they like freedom. So there's a sort of interesting overlap where <coughs> very conservative right-wing people over on the right coast, we're here on the left coast, and us, we both like freedom. It's just that whom we want it for can sometimes differ and how we define it can sometimes differ. But I'm like a Quaker in the sense that I really have no objection cooperating with people where we can cooperate, provided it does not create confusion about what we stand for. So the advantage of Gene Sharp's approach that this is only about shaking off tyrants is you can get a wet, much wider network. A lot of people who are militaristically inclined don't believe in the power of soul force, but they don't like tyrants. Uh, they Sometimes they're a little bit selective about which tyrants they like and which tyrants they don't like. But, you know, it's an imperfect world. They don't like tyrants. You can cooperate with them, get their money, and so forth. The difficulty where that approach and that openness becomes difficult is that sometimes you have people attempting to use nonviolent strategies in causes that we would feel uncomfortable with. And I'll mention one in particular. You're probably well aware that there's been a wave of electoral ref uh, changes in Central America and South America, particularly South America, Bolivia, the Bolivian model they're calling it. And in Brazil, Bolivia, Chile, and Ecuador, and one other place that I'm forgetting. Maybe you want to count Nicaragua. We'll see what happens with Danielle. But anyway, you have people who have been elected to office who are very populist. And one of them is this extremely troubling, difficult, you love him and you hate him guy, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, who uh, is very populist. He's done a lot for the poor in that country. On the other hand, he knows absolutely nothing about nonviolence. He's trying to arm the population with handguns so they can keep out the American military when they attack Venezuela. So I'm dying to get an hour conversation with that guy and I'm working very hard on my Spanish to <laughs> make it work. But there are we definitely – the forces in Venezuela that want him out are definitely reactionary. And in some cases, the people who've been developing a bag of tricks called nonviolent strategies are helping these reactionary people to use nonviolent tactics to get rid of Chavez, which is <coughs> – Problematic for us on the theoretical – I keep saying us as though you all agree totally with everything that I think. <laughs> I know. Go ahead and wave your hands wildly <laughs> if I'm <laughs> overstepping it here. But uh, us, this micro world of principled nonviolence would have two problems with that. One is that theoretically it does not work to use nonviolent means for ends which are not really just any more than it works to use violent means for ends that are just. And now realize that Nagler's Law cuts both ways, which gets us one step closer to the Nobel Prize in <laughs> social mathematics. Mm -hmm. You can't mix in a little bit of violence and with your nonviolence and expect it to be nonviolent. You can't use nonviolent means for a not so savory end and expect it to work. Um, and the other thing is it would just create a lot of confusion because you muddle up the clarity of the situation. Okay, so one problem or difference that we would have with this uh, – what should we call it? The Harvard School. Uh, I hope we get to work this all out on the football field someday. One difference is they're talking only about one situation, namely overthrowing dictators. And the other difference is that in the end, when you really take them down to the Harvard Club and get them drunk and say, okay, what kind of thing is nonviolence, they will define it negatively. 
they will say, and you heard Gene Sharp say this, this is how you withdraw legitimacy, this is how you withdraw support. Okay, for us, me, <laughs> and however many of you are provisionally going along with me, for us, if you don't get onto the positive <coughs> wavelength, you haven't really made the transition from the world we're trying to get out of to the world we're trying to get into. So yes, there is a negative aspect to nonviolent power. <coughs> Martin Luther King said, you non-cooperate with evil, but you cooperate with good. And the real transition happens when you realize that good is realer than evil and that cooperating with it is basic. It's more important than non-cooperating with evil. If you cooperate with good, the non-cooperations will tend to structure themselves in a way that's in your favor. Whereas if you go after evil purely and simply, at very best you'll have a time-limited success. And I was thinking of a line from Goethe the other day. It's good to think of lines from Goethe every now and then. And I'm sorry that Matthias isn't here. But uh, in this play, which is about a good man's encounter with evil, he meets the devil, which was pretty far out to do that way back in the 18th century, and asks him, who are you? And the devil, uh, Mephistopheles, comes out with this famous line, which has just been ringing in my ears the last couple of days. Ich bin der Geist, der stets verneint. Amy? Not quite. <laughs> you can get this far, right? Okay. He answers, I am that spirit which ever denies. I am that spirit which ever denies. Nine means no. You probably knew that from World War II movies and stuff like this. So verneinen means to deny. Who said that about the Netherlands? Yeah, hello. Yeah, thanks. Okay. <coughs> so, I am slightly taking liberties with this. That spirit which ever says no or denies. And that's the devil speaking. So, <laughs> I, this, I use this to illustrate very dramatically that Wir sind der Geist, der stets verjaht. We are that spirit which always affirms. But of course you have to find what you're affirming. It has to be an affirmative thing in itself. <coughs> and then your relationship with the no will come about. Okay, so with all of these caveats, uh, the, the school of thought has been extremely helpful and they created this documentary as I say, you have to hand it to them. This is the first time we got onto mainstream television with the idea of nonviolence. You had mainstream television about the civil rights movement, but no attempt to explain what was causing it to happen. And it's called A Force More Powerful, which is a terrific title uh, for reasons that we've discussed. And I have usually been using their segment. They cover about eight different uh, nonviolent uprisings. I usually use the segment on Denmark. Because we've so far talked about nonviolent insurrections happening in other parts of the world while the Second World War was going on. We talked about nonviolence manifesting itself as conscientious objection in this country. But there's also the question, or the much more gray area from the nonviolence point of view, that is, that what about uh, nonviolent resistance to Hitler? Or what about you know, resistance to Hitler? And there's an array of cases that you look at to try to get this information. One of the ones that they discussed <coughs> was the resistance in Denmark. Okay, now, the resistance in Denmark was relatively easy in one sense. And that is that according to their own uh, fantastic racial ideologies, Danes are higher than Germans <laughs> in the great chain of being, right? Because they're taller and blonder. <laughs> a friend of mine who was a German Jew was escaping through Denmark at the beginning of the war and he was talking to a Danish person who said, watch out for that guy over there, he's German. And my friend Tom said, how do you know? He said, well, he's small and dark. 
<laughs> so there's this, you know, where you could do anything to poles and any, you know, as you go further down south, people get less and less human. But it was a little bit difficult for the Germans to say, you know, blonde hair and blue eyes, uba alles. Uh, and so that made the work of the Danes a little bit easier. There's no question about that. But they mounted a resistance which was definitely mostly nonviolent um, in the form of withdrawal, strikes, slowdowns. They would blow all the factory whistles at 11 a.m. and everyone would say, we have to go home and tend our garden and leave the work. But the fact is they also blew up factories when there was nobody in them. So this gets us into the very gray area which is technically known today as property destruction. Okay, a factory that's being used for the German war effort, they wait till everybody goes home and they blow it up. Is that okay? And I'm just leaving that for now as a question, but it's going to be a very real question for us here in this country. That, you know, do you, is it okay to spill blood on draft files, beat nose cones with a hammer, and so forth? Uh, and I, it has to be said that the Danish underground did have the awkward habit of occasionally assassinating collaborators. So I think we're going from white to gray to black. That's not nonviolent. You walk in on somebody and you, you know, shoot them in their own apartment. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm willing to bend quite a bit, but this is not nonviolent. But I would say the property destruction is kind of in between. And then the really positive thing that they did, and there were only two countries in Europe that really did this to an extraordinary degree, was to rescue their Jewish population. So the other country, by the way, is Bulgaria. It, uh, Bulgaria ended up with more Jews at the end of the war than at the beginning. It was the only country in Europe that had that uh, record. There was a remarkable event uh, campaign that took place in southern France, which I'll talk about in a minute. But the Danes, the Danish underground, which really had the ear and the heart of the people, decided to not let the Germans take their Jews. And uh, when things got hotter and hotter, they planned this incredible escape. It's very – I'm really in a way – I'm sorry I'm not showing the film because it's extremely heartrending and very dramatic. Interestingly enough, the night that – the night before the Germans had planned to round up all the Jews, their own naval attaché, a man by the name of Duckwitz, called the Danish underground and said, if you want to save the Jews, you've got to get them out of the country now. And 7,000 people were huddled onto these boats, you know, fishing boats, whatever they had, and off across the North Atlantic to Sweden, which was, of course, a neutral country. I'm addressing the Swedish contingent over here. And uh, they were then safe. Mostly safe. Uh, a particular German Jew, half Jew, his name was uh, Niel, Niels Bohr, who was one of the fathers of uh, uh, quantum theory, was one of those people who got rescued. And uh, he pulled off his own little one-man satyagraha, which you know about from reading my book. But it's, I think really good stories are worth <coughs> repeating. Uh, when all of those Jews landed there, the king of Sweden was a little bit nervous about taking them in. He was not sure he might lose their neutrality. Uh, and Niels Bohr went to him and said, that's okay. If you don't take them in, I'm turning myself over to the Gestapo. And they knew what he had and what that would mean. So the king immediately said, no, no, it's all right. We'll, we'll hold on to all of them. It was like, a one per like the, the dear king, Jataka, I'll sacrifice myself, no problem. And the king said, no, 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 wait a minute. We can't have you do that. And uh, they saved them all. So that was an extremely dramatic episode. The other – so one of the questions we would look at is direct resistance. Was there any of the nonviolent kind? And in that category, you'd look at the Rosenstrasse prison demonstration. And the other kind of event was rescue operations, which took place here and there. I just mentioned the Danish one. The other one that I'd like to mention took place in the south of France in a little village called Le Chambon. Le Chambon sur Ligny. Oops, it's a Y. The name of a river. 
This was an area in the south of France which had been settled by Huguenots. And Huguenots, in other words, are Protestants who's, uh, and a lot of Dutch uh, – sorry, a lot of French Huguenots emigrated to Holland. And you have, you, that's why you have so many French names among Dutch people. Well, that's one of the reasons. <laughs> the other reason is they're nice names, so <laughs> go ahead and use them. Um, but this was, in other words, a community which was itself not a mainstream community and had experienced uh, persecution. So – and there was a pastor – and this is a name that I'd like you to remember – André Crocmé. And he represents something that's typical in modern nonviolence and that is – a key individual who has some training and is able to mobilize people. So in the Rosenstrasse prison demonstration, this was absolutely absent. As far as I know, nobody involved in that episode, which you could, is incredibly important for you guys to know about <coughs> incidentally. Because you, per you know perfectly well when you're sitting there in the free speech cafe, somebody will come over. And say, oh, that's an interesting book. What are you studying? Say nonviolence. Next thing that person's going to say, you know, you know, if you could only get a nickel every time they did this, we'd be able to fund the whole PACS program. <laughs> they will say it would not have worked against Hitler. <coughs> and then you will say, have you read Nagler's book? Or <laughs> another way to approach it was Rosenstrasse. And they say, was? <laughs> Then you tell them the story of how these five, six thousand women rescued their husbands from the jaws of the Gestapo. It was an incredible event and we should all know about it. But in that event, it was completely grassroots. Nobody – there were no leaders. There's been a film about Rosenstrasse. I have not seen this film because uh, from the reviews, it looked like they screwed it up terribly and I'd be very disappointed. We don't want me to be disappointed, so I don't go and see it. But they may have changed it in the film because that's what films do. But the fact is that they're just – this is just people calling – housewives calling housewives and they all mustered out and refused to go home. And in three days, the Gestapo caved in and gave back all their men. But at Le Chambon, there was somebody – Croquemé was a minister, a Protestant minister, and he had also worked with the Fellowship of Reconciliation or in his case, the International Fellowship of Reconciliation. So he had been exposed to the ideas of Gandhi and the theories of nonviolence. And when the Vichy government was set up – I don't know how much of this history you are familiar with – but the north of France was directly occupied by the German administration militarily. The south of France had a puppet government which was called the Vichy regime. But it was essentially a fascist regime speaking French instead of a fascist regime speaking German. And um, when the regime was set up and they started to put out orders, Kochme and his wife Magda, they called the whole congregation together and said, how do you want to respond? And they said, uh, we don't want to go along with it. And so they began to organize themselves as a refugee network. And they probably rescued somewhere between six, maybe the top end, about 10,000 refugees during the war, mostly Jewish refugees. And this has been written about in a book called Lest Innocent Blood Be Shed. And I'm sure you have that on your resource list and so forth. There's a quote from the Jewish Bible somewhere. And the author of that is Philip Halley, H-A-L-L-I-E. And it's definitely raw material for writing a paper on. It's an extremely good example of how to do nonviolence with limited resources for a specific goal under the worst situation imaginable. You're under Nazi occupation. I was going to say I found the movie. Yeah. Like yeah. 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 And Alex, you notice I didn't mention that movie. This was a documentary, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. No, well, it was kind of it wasn't a documentary. 
Maybe it's one that I didn't see. Oh, a French movie. I see. Well, maybe you could find out the title of it anyway. And Le Chambon, probably. Yeah. But there was a film called uh, – oh, I'm, I'm not going to remember, but it, it's a story by somebody who was born in Le Chambon to a Jewish family and they eventually got him out of there. Um, but I didn't like that film because it was all about, you know, where were you Christians? You should have been rescuing us and all of this bitterness and stuff. And I don't know. It's not my style. A couple of quick stories from that movie though and then I would like to um, go back to the film that we've just seen in two stages. One of the stories is um, Cochme himself had to go to Paris for some reason. Of course, it was dangerous. And they went to the railway station, Gare du Nord or whichever one it was, to go back. And he's traveling with his 12-year-old son. And uh, unfortunately, there is a roundup. And everybody's being held. The papers are being looked at. Now, Trocme, at the beginning of the war, this will be very interesting for us, <coughs> at the beginning of the occupation, he took a strange sort of vow, which is, I will never lie. I don't care what they do, whatever they, whoever captures me, whatever they ask me, I'm going to tell them the truth. So if he had been caught in this roundup, it would have been pretty bad because they would have said, you know, okay, what's your name? André Trocme, what's your profession? Minister, what do you do? I rescue Jews. Uh, I don't think that would have bounced very high. So <laughs> you can't run that up the tricolor and color and expect people to salute it. So he was caught and put in a railroad car being held for questioning. Meanwhile, his son, who's 12 years old, is outside the station waiting for his father. When his father didn't show up, the little boy comes in looking for him. And he walks past this car and looks up in the window and he sees his father. And of course he goes into shock, not knowing that the German guard is watching him. And when the guard sees the shock in the boy's face, he relents and lets Trochme out, thus saving him. Because as I say, if he had been questioned, he would have been shot. Absolutely no question about it. This is a, some of the strange ways that nonviolence has. You make these weird sacrifices and these vows and take these risks. Sometimes, you know, don't come back and tell me about it if it doesn't work, okay? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not telling you to do it. I'm just saying that sometimes when you do do it, there's a strange force that comes into play and helps you. And on another occasion, the same principle was invoked. Trocme André and his brother Daniel were arrested along with a bunch of people who were communists. And it was mainly the French police, so they weren't as hard-nosed as the German police on the French. And uh, they said, okay, you guys, if you just sign this oath saying that you're not a communist, we'll let you go. Okay, so the 20 people who were communists, they signed the oath saying, we are not communists. <coughs> they came to the Trocme brothers and they said, we're not going to sign it. We don't do that. You know, no loyalty oaths here. Next thing you know, you're going to have it at UC Berkeley if, you, if you're not careful. Now, what do you think resulted? You'll never guess. It's kind of shocking, actually. The Trocmes were released and all the other people were shot. Right? Because the police knew perfectly well that they were communists and they shot them because they were cowards and they did not shoot the Trocmes because they admired their courage. So that's – Strange but true. Uh, and it also turned out after the war that uh, the major who was in charge of this uh, district knew perfectly well what the Trochmes and all those people were doing. But as he said, this has nothing to do with violence and it is not something that violence can overcome. And he turned the other way at the risk of his life. So the universe bends toward justice is one of the phrases that – we use in this movement and it is strange how nonviolence sometimes works and sometimes protects its <laughs> devotees. Okay, so what's going to happen now over the weekend, I'm going to email you the revised syllabus and the, 
the chapters that I want you to read from the Wink book. But do be reading the Zunas, Kurtz, and Osher chapters. Try and maybe get through all three sets by next week. So it will be just one jump ahead. We'll have useful material that way. And the stuff in the reader, which is pretty straightforward. Especially Michael True's essay on the – his journalism on the Tiananmen massacre. Okay. So now, any questions before I charge ahead? Okay. If I leave Goethe on the board there, I think it's probably a good thing for these public health people or whoever else gets into this classroom. Um, So as I said, we're going to go at this two ways. Um, first, I'd like to start with you setting up a framework and a set of categories into which you can put events <coughs> and observations because by the time the semester is over, we will have discussed maybe somewhere between 30 and 50 episodes, some of them being very long campaigns, some of them being like a short campaign like Rosenstrasse. Some of them being just a momentary interaction. Some of them being both. You know, uh, the People's Power Revolution was a fairly long campaign with a nonviolent moment embedded in it. And they kept referring to that EDSA rebellion. So in order to keep all of these things straight and understand them, we're going to be able to think about them in some categories. So I'm going to go over that with you. Start putting some categories on the board and start putting our observation from the films into those categories. Now, the way we're approaching these key episodes that we're dealing with in the insurrectionary chapter of our course is we're going to be reading historical overviews of them. So you get sort of the political blow-by-blow blow of what happened from a historical point of view. But the films will take us into the consciousness of the participants to some extent, which is an extremely valuable complement. If this were a political science course, which I have been told by political scientists it is not <laughs> and they don't want me in their building, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> if it were, I would say that personal experience part is secondary. But for us, because we're person power people – sounds funny, but that's sort of what we are. Each of us is a person power person, let's put it that way. The individual experience is critical and helps to determine the other aspects of the event. Okay? So in terms of categories, I'm going to start us off with one and that is the situation by which I mean, you know, the – what's the problem and what are the strengths and the strains in that situation? That terminology Strengths and Strains comes from a book that Kenneth Boulding wrote in 1972. He's one of our two great heroes of peace research. That book was called Stable Peace. It was written in Texas, which I think is kind of cute. <laughs> and uh, he has a chapter in there called Strengths and Strains and he describes very well how you have certain advantages and certain disadvantages in every situation. If you know what they are, play from your strengths and avoid your, the weaknesses, you're obviously just going to do better. And we're going to look at our three – let's see, categories will go this way. Let's take the three that are in that film just for starters, the Intifada – the Chilean plebiscite and uh, the People's Power Rebellion in the Philippines. Okay? Now, the Intifada and the Chilean situation were the same situation that they were both dictatorships. Well, hang on. Wait. This is wrong. These two were both dictatorships. This was a different kind of thing and I'm not sure right off the top what difference it makes. But in these two cases, the – okay, I'm going to borrow a term now from 
military and cowboy ideology. <laughs> in these latter two cases, the bad guys were both the same ethnic group as the population at large. The intifada, the occupation was different because these are closely related people in terms of DNA, but they've had very different historical experiences and that probably is the worst formula for disaster. You know, the Armenians and the Turks had a lot in common and so when they came apart, it was horrible. Similarly, Cambodia, similarly Rwanda where they pretended that they were from different races. And uh, so here these are people who are close but recognizably different and one people is oppressing the other. Okay, so this is a slightly different situation. Uh, now let me just start us off by mentioning another category and we'll start plugging them in. Who are the players? Um, and here we could talk both about organizations and people. And I'm not saying we need to you know, fill this out completely for right now, but let's just get ourselves started so we're thinking in those terms. In the case of the Intifada, the over th and incidentally, don't, don't forget this is Intifada 1 we're talking about. The late 80s, first Intifada. You're going to read a chapter or two about it in your, or you've already done in Zinus, Kurtz and Asher and I'm going to tell you more about it because that's a lot of fun to do. Uh, and you've seen a little bit about it in the film. Uh, but so here talking both in terms of organizations and people, who are the players? Just put in anybody, anybody or anything. Alex? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There are committees. Committees is nobody's favorite thing, but they're at least a lot better than governments or, or doing nothing. Um, you also had, and the film wasn't too clear about this, but you had some leading individuals like Jonathan Kutab. I had a long distance phone conversation with him once before Skype was invented. So that was a lot of money. I think the classics department ended up paying for it though. But uh, Kutab is a lawyer and he's a very well educated guy, speaks English very well as you heard. And so he is you know, an inspirational person for the uprising. And what his best friend and the reason that I called him that time Sorry. Is a guy named Mubarak Awad, who was a Palestinian born in the occupied territories. His father was killed in 1946 in what they call El Nakba, the catastrophe, an uprising. Uh, that followed the UN decision to give uh, about 70 percent of Palestine to the Jews, to Israel. His father was killed. Nobody knows who killed him. They didn't even have a place to bury him. It, it, Mubarak is not Muslim, but even Christians like to bury their dead in recognizable places set aside for that purpose. They had to bury him in the front yard of their house. He, d he distinctly remembers and you can get him talking about this anytime. He's often addressed this course and I have a standing invitation for him to do that. He remembers his mother saying to him and his brothers all the time, whatever you do, don't hate. Whatever you do. You know, I'm not telling you don't go out and fight. I'm telling you don't let hatred eat into your soul. They're very serious uh, Mennonites. And um, – Okay, let's, I could say, could say a lot about almost any of this stuff, but let's go on a little bit to sort of start filling this out. Who were some of the key people or players in Chile? I mean on the nonviolent side. There were of course – we all know who the big player was <laughs> on the, uh, the dictatorship side. But we won't say anything bad about him because he is just 
test on. Yeah. And there was two Father Jose Alicante. Yeah. So I'm just going to put down Father Jose for here. And uh, you remember Professor Arriaga? He, he was a key person. But actually, I don't know that he actually played much of a role except to get himself interviewed <laughs> by the movie. Which I mean, you know, which is kind of neat, but I don't know what else he did. Yeah. Also, Eduardo Turin, the uh, Yeah, yeah. So, okay, for media, we had Eduardo Turini. Good. Oh, that's interesting. What role did Lagos play? Um, if you notice in the filming, uh, they said, um, you know, like a couple weeks before the scene was set in Thailand. Yeah. All of a sudden, everyone was out in the streets. Right. Um, but Lagos is one of the first uh, televised segments of how uh -huh. the media started to play a role. Uh -huh. um, he was then the, the chancellor of the main university. Oh, okay. And he was the first person to really publicly uh, denounce the police there in college. Wow. Ah. And it's called like the wagging of the finger. Like Lagos is just in this like 20 second um, clip, mm -hmm. like totally off script during the, uh -huh. the interview. And, and he just started uh -huh. saying, you know, Pinochet, mm -hmm. and he's, he's led this you know, hateful dictatorship. Mm -hmm. And this is a focal content of the main thing. Wow. Good. Yeah, well, let's get, yeah, let's get back to that in a minute. But okay, here's an important person who was a chancellor of the main university in Santiago, I would assume, and was the first public person to come out on television and accuse Pinochet. And that's extremely important for phase one of Gene Sharp's four-part phases, which is overcome fear. Yeah, so that, that – mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Right. So he was a key figure. Lagos sounds to me from what you're saying now that he was a key figure in that he kind of stepped out. He came out of the, the, the closet of fear and survived. And once he did that with his public <laughs> reputation, uh, it changed things. Dramatically galvanized people's courage. Toward the end of this semester, we're going to have a look at a, a DVD called The Nonviolent Moment. I blush <laughs> because uh, it's, it stars me, actually. <laughs> but <laughs> it's, uh, it consists of film clips from feature films in which nonviolent moments happen. And the first one, is an extremely dramatic episode that took place in Rangoon, probably 1987, I would guess, where there was a huge public demonstration and the uh, Buddhist op opposition leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, was going to address a rally. It's portrayed very dramatically and I will show it to you. And, and uh, this rifle squad blocks her way and they say, stop or we'll shoot. And she manages to walk right through them. And they didn't shoot her. Part of the reason was undoubtedly that she was a woman, undoubtedly that she was courageous and didn't hate them. But also part of it was that she was Aung San Suu Kyi. Her father was the general Aung San who had fought the J British for the Japanese and then fought the Japanese for the British and got both of them out of Burma and then was assassinated about 16 months later. But she was such an icon that if they had shot her, they would have felt like they were shooting the whole country. So it sounds to me that Lagos had a little bit of that charisma going for him. Okay. Good. B by the way, there's lots of things that that documentary did not have in it. So you know, we'll be plugging them in. Okay. Now, Philippines, I hope you'll be able to see down here. But who were some of the main players there? People and or organizations. If you've done any of the reading at that 
if you've gone down to the third chapter for the reading, you'll see that there was – I always forget exactly how to spell it – Akapka, a big resistance organization that got founded. But do you remember a non-Philippine woman who was interviewed very briefly? She's an important person. I'm going to write her name up here even though it belongs down there. And that was Hildegard Gossmeyer. And see, I'm trying to take people who represent certain things and what she represents again in an even more dramatic form than Mubarak or Andre Tokme is – what should we call these people? Um, we could call them tipping point people or spark plug people or I think maybe we'll just call them helpful outsiders. These are people who – this is a very interesting balance that we've been slowly learning about over the last 20 years. The balance between having something be purely indigenous on the one hand, like the Rosenstrasse prison demonstration, nobody even knows about it, much less goes there and helps, helps out, versus the kind – on the other extreme, the kind of intervention where you think you're going to go in and do it for somebody. Like, oh, you're having a problem with a, a dictator? Well, we'll bomb your country until he gives up <laughs> and then you'll be free. Uh, which for some reason doesn't work. But, uh, I'll leave that up for you to write essays on in the, the final. And in between, you have this very interesting balance where on the one hand, you really need outside support in two ways. One is often you don't know anything about nonviolence and you need somebody to come in and tell you what the hell it is and how to use it. And this is exactly what Hildegard Gossmeyer was able to do. A very, very well-trained person. She herself was a German woman married to an Alsatian French man named Goss. And she has written extensively on nonviolence. She wrote a book called when one find a friend of Erden, when enemies become friends, and a lot of other books. She worked in the Philippines for years, which the film didn't tell you anything about. I think this is kind of an interesting omission because the fact is if she hadn't been there, I'm not sure this thing would have worked because she had that marvelous balance to say, okay, here's what I know and I can share with you, but here's how you are going to have to do it. Recognizing the fact that in every culture without exception, there are certain ways of crafting conflict resolutions. I just read – I hope I don't lose my train of thought because I liked it, but I can't help telling you this little story <laughs> that I just read yesterday is about a, a village uh, somewhere in Africa where people had to walk practically all day to get water. So you had, it takes practically the whole day to reach the river practically the whole next day to get back. So a development agency came in and said, this is terrible. This is undeveloped. We're going to go back to Europe and raise money and come here and dig wells and give you people pumps. So they did and they were, they were uh, intermediate technology pumps. This is not like you needed computers to run these pumps, right? It's like this. And so they brought in all these pumps. It was great. It took, you know, 10 minutes to get the water for your family. So this development agency came back a year later to see how it's going. How do you like the pumps? <coughs> they saw to their horror that the elders of the village had destroyed the pumps by stoning them. They had the whole village stand around. It's like what we do to television sets on the Berkeley campus. <laughs> they did it to their pumps. They said, why did you do this? You know, we took so much trouble. It was so wonderful. They said, you know, within a few months of putting in those pumps, this village started falling apart. Why? Because the walk down to get the water, families did it together and they talked to their neighbors. As soon as we had the pumps, we said, okay, the hell with you. <laughs> we don't need to talk to our kids anymore. We don't need to talk to our neighbors anymore. 
the whole fabric of the village fell apart. This illustrates the danger of trying to parachute in and teach people things which make sense in your culture but blow up their culture. And in fact, we even have a name for this kind of mistake. Nowadays, it's called peace imperialism. I've got peace and you don't. I'm going to give it to you and you will, you will, I will be your benefactor. Now, uh, some people when they encounter peace imperialism, they get so upset that they say, don't go anywhere. <laughs> Let everybody do it themselves. Just in terms of knowing what to do, this is not a good idea. We need each other. Now, there's another reason why we need each other. And I will never forget this. I was at a meeting in Santa Cruz, the second best campus of the entire UC system. And uh, my grandson is going there. It's a really neat place. A meeting on uh, the first intifada was still going on. Mubarak Awad was there. And we asked him, okay, you know, we do peace team training and all this. Do you want us to come? And he said, yes, I want you to be there. But don't tell us what to do. Just be there. And we said, why? He said, look, we are willing to die, but we don't want to die alone. We don't want to die and not have the world know what we have done. So in terms of a very important thing called solidarity, human companionship, whatever you want to call it, it's very important in ways that we don't know how to quantify or even talk about very much. It's very important that these movements not be left in isolation. And you'll see. Steve Zunas, who has studied them pretty extensively, has been able to show that if you have a nonviolent uprising and nobody pays any attention, it's very unlikely to succeed. If you pay the wrong kind of attention, here's my guess, it'll probably succeed for the wrong reason and it won't develop into anything permanent. The right kind of attention is I'm coming in here with special expertise as a third party and I can help you mobilize your nonviolent resources. And I'm here willing to risk my life with you. Two extremely important uh, elements of third party presence. So Hildegard Gossmeyer, who is uh, anyhow an extremely important person in the world of modern nonviolence and you, I want you to know about her. I'd like to bring her here, but she's a little bit on the elderly side at this point. She comes in primarily with that first capacity of being able to teach, being able to teach nonviolence. Okay. So players, now let me ask you, what other kinds of categories do you think we might set up that would help us compare and contrast these events, campaigns, episodes, whatever they are? What else might we look at? Amy? Okay. Yep. Strategies. And of course, for our purposes, you know, how nonviolent are they? And if so, which flavor? That kind of question. Let's just throw one strategy each up here. What's, what's one thing that they did in the Intifada? Two things, because you're going to mention one, Nick, and then it's another one that I can't resist. Go ahead. Uh, Civilian-based defense. Did they do that in the Intifada? Uh, interesting. How, how, how would you define civilian-based defense for the moment? Okay, Nick, is, I, I like this. Uh, I especially like it when people come up with things I hadn't th thought of. Of course, I was going to say that. You understand? <laughs> but civilian-based defense is based 
uh, I guess a couple of principles, it's a non-territorial defense. So you don't do what they call in the military, I think they call it shallow interdiction where you don't even let them get close, but you do deep interdiction. Not really because military deep interdiction means you let them come in and then you fight them. I think that's – I don't know anything about military strategy. Let's forget I even said that. The point is you don't try to keep them physically out of your country. And in nonviolence, we perk up our ears and say, hey, I like this because Gandhi had very big ears. As you know, he was always perking them up. <laughs> I like this because preventing people from crossing that line is sort of symbolic. So we're going to – and we don't want to do symbolic f struggles. So we let them come in, but we don't let them overtake our institutions. That's the important part. And then here's where Nick chimed in with a very important principle that makes this work well. You are against the occupation and against everything that these people tell you as occupiers, but you're not against them as people. I w Boy, I think the level of hatred on the part of most Palestinians was so great that this might be a little marginal in terms of that particular category. <laughs> so I'm not talking about the ones that strap on bombs, you know, and go to a cafe in Tel Aviv. But there was not a whole lot of fraternization. In fact, this is one of the key problems with the Intifada all along is that there's so little contact between Palestinians and Jews. Even between Pal Jews in Israel and Arabs in Israel, it's like they're in two different worlds. They don't talk to each other. That's why institutions that try to bridge that gap are very helpful up to a point. And have you seen the film called Promises? Yeah. Okay. So CBD was one thing. Now <laughs> I'm going to mention another nonviolent technique called chickens. Remember they had uh, – a lot of homes had chickens and rabbits in the basement because there were lots of times when they couldn't go shopping. Well, this may seem like a simple survival strategy and undoubtedly for some people it was. But the fact is that that first intifada was remarkable because whether they wanted to or not, they were almost compelled to create an alternative society. The schools, remember, they were doing illegal clandestine schools. They had these networks set up where people would get milk and bring it into the villages. Babysitting stuff took place so that if your parents were arrested, you were not left on your own devices and neighbors would take you in. And that reached such a point, as Mubarak once told this class some years ago, every woman became every child's mother. Now think of what a wonderful thing this is. It's, un it's unfortunate that it took an occupation to make it happen. But the fact is that they were responding to the occupation with constructive means, which meant that they would be in an advanced position if the occupation ever were to be shaken off. This is kind of a tragedy. At this point, I'm going to – Bring up something in the film and uh, revise it to my own satisfaction and that is the schema. You remember step one, overcome fear. I'm totally okay with that. I hate fear as a matter of fact. Uh, I fear hate and I hate fear. Uh, second, can anybody fill me, help me with this, the second and third? You form networks I think, you know, community get together. Community and empowerment is the second. And the third was you bring about the defection of the military and the uniformed authorities. Is that it? Okay. Got that? Good for me. I've only seen this film about six times. And number four for him was basically you build the alternative society that you want. I forget what he was calling it, but you build the next order. Now. The Gandhian position was very clear on this. He said, if you think that you're going to overthrow an authority and then build a better world, you are dreaming. This is never going to happen. He was very, very strong on this point. 
you've got to build the world that you want first. In fact, it goes along with our negative positive principle. You know, if the occupation is a the, uh, whatever is oppressing you is a negative, you want to overcome it with positives. You will not get very far saying, get off our backs, leave us alone. It's much better to stand up and have them fall off your back automatically. And of course, you can give them a little push if they don't. Sue. Um, I thought there was a question about the Philippines. Yeah. There was like this amazing yeah. demonstration with all the soldiers and they yeah. said, yeah. That's right. That what Sid is saying is exactly right. I think the film brought this out without knowing what to call it. Poor people, they hadn't taken Pax 164, so what can you expect? But they did this marvelous overthrow and then didn't know where to go with it. And it's in a heartbeat, it goes back to the same old, same old. If anything, in some ways it's even worse. You have the commercialization of the ETSA intersection. And the poverty gets worse. You have people in the 70s on Smoky Mountain and now they're there in droves. So this is why uh, when we were talking about it last year, we decided step four should be step one. In fact, that was a question on the midterm. Hint, hint. <laughs> step four should be step one, unquote. What does that mean? Explain why. Yeah, it, it's – it's very interesting, but I think uh, the Philippine case proves what Gandhi was saying more clearly than any other because you could not have asked for a better revolution. In terms of nonviolence, there was almost no violence. It was like 99 percent in compliance with Nagler's law. It worked, quote unquote, succeeded completely, got them out of there, um, and then nothing. And unfortunately, when you create a power vacuum, the kinds of people who rush into that power vacuum tend to be the kinds of people who like power because right? they've just been hanging around waiting for their opportunity. So it is not typically the case that the new regime is headed up by school teachers, idealists, artists, things like that. It's these people in the woodwork who've always, you know, just were waiting for their opportunity to get their hands on the levers of power. So you don't let that vacuum be – you don't let that vacuum happen. That's – overall, this is the most important strategy for uh, an insurrectionary overthrow. Okay, terrific. Um, strategies in Chile. Just one or two so you can just sort of get the idea. ¿Qué hicieron el pueblo? Which I think means what did the people do? <laughs> yes, Sid? Did you utilize the penance that you're going to Yep. Okay. And uh, I think they did that very well. They were given 15 <coughs> minutes of television. Now, one of the reactions they could have had was – you're giving us 15 minutes and you're keeping 23 hours and 45 minutes for yourself. That's unfair. Hell no, we won't take it down with television. That would have been one reaction. In, in they Instead, they went on and had Professor Chancellor Lagos make very good use of it. They showed happy people. Incidentally, this is a very important little strategy uh, which the old left that I used to belong to never caught on to because we, we were totally grim. We were not going to crack a smile until the revolution was over. And you can see hundreds of photographs. You go take a look in the Free Speech Cafe. I'm in one of those pictures, I'm sure, somewhere. I haven't found myself. I go in there drinking latte after latte, <laughs> looking for myself up on the wall. <laughs> uh, but somewhere you'll see us all. You'll uh, when we get to the next documentary about the Utpour Rebellion, you'll see how they made very creative uses of happiness. Funny thing. <laughs> happiness – I'm all – I'm in favor of happiness. Don't get me wrong. So they made use of the media. They made use – more generally, they made use of the resources that they had without uh, 
try and do other things. And of course they did other things simply to show up was disobedience at that point. So they did a lot of disobedience. Ultimately they had a constitutional mechanism <coughs> and so they were able to use it and they did to very good effect. That's great. You, you, you don't want to go to jail, be martyred, all this stuff if you can help it. You know, if you can vote the new millennium in, I'm in favor of it. Because it won't work anymore because you have these die bulb machines. They'll just vote it out again. But you know, if you had a regime where there was no voter fraud, uh, that would be great. Yeah, Matt. Oh, okay. But a lot of it was church based, so there are a lot of group meetings like in basements and yeah. churches and the Catholic Church played a, a big role, kind of like the, the way it controlled all of the things. Yeah. Very good point. There was in the culture of the times this whole concept called liberation theology, which in Chiapas will become defined as preferential option for the poor. There was a period when, uh, after Vatican II, the church was taking a stand for the people. Unfortunately, de sa fortuna la mente, that's not happening to anywhere near that degree right now. I remember having a talk with this Irish Catholic priest up in our town, Tomales, California. Have you heard of Tomales? Sign outside Tomales says population 500. I, I think they're counting the cows and the sheep to get up to 500. <laughs> But anyway, there's a Catholic priest there. He was a great guy and I was having a talk with him. And he said, I think the church has lost its prophetic voice. And it was around this issue of not standing up for the terrible poverty that was taking place throughout South and Central America. So time and time again, uh, in the Philippines, even more pronounced, Hildegard Gosmeyer herself got in there in, as a Catholic person in a Catholic-based community. And in the move, a landless workers movement, which we're going to be discussing later on in Brazil, the church was extremely important and extremely helpful in two ways, I guess. One, the church had a structure. You didn't have to invent affinity groups because you had them. They were called parishes. So it had, pl had places you could go to and communities and structures of uh, organization in place. That's huge. Because usually you're starting up from the grassroots, you've got nothing. Secondly, what was the other thing that the church had, which is even more important, of course? Remember that shot of this <coughs> monk, this friar, whoever he was, walking towards the soldiers uh, during the Etza rebellion? What did he have? The nuns handing out the loaves of bread to the soldiers? This is an obvious question, probably too obvious for you. Think dumb. This is something you do extremely simple. Nagler couldn't possibly be asking us this. What is it that the church brings? Hmm? Um, okay, I know what you're getting at, Amy. I'm not sure I would put it that way. Legitimacy, a huge, you know, the big L. They had moral authority. And sometimes that's very important. I remember seeing a cartoon probably in the New Yorker many years ago, many years ago. Richard Nixon was still president and it's these two guys drinking in a bar and one of them says to the other, Nixon's no fool. If the people wanted moral leadership, he would give it to them. But usually people actually do want it or you can at least use it to buttress legitimacy. Of course, there are occasions situations when this is exactly the wrong way to go. I'm thinking now of the Spanish Civil War where the people hated the church more than they hated the government and they spent a lot of time disinterring <laughs> monks and nuns and humiliating them, which they should have been using fighting Franco in my private opinion. But anyway, it's not to say that the church ipso facto has moral authority, but it can have. And in the Philippines, it definitely did. And in Chile, it was also partly there to be used. Okay. Um, strategies in the Philippines. Remember the 
the first one that the Elon Ziv was always asking questions about, you think this is really going to work? What good is this going to do? Remember? Jogging. Jogging. Very important revolutionary tactic. And um, <coughs> running a little short here, but two comments about that. Remember that very nice young lady who spoke English well? She was asked, what, what good is jogging going to do? Do you remember what she said? Yeah, Zoe? Yeah. Okay. So jogging for peace falls under the category uh, that Nagler identifies as symbolic action because it's not like Marcos is standing there in the road and you're running him over. <laughs> you're not doing anything concrete against the regime. But symbolic episodes of this kind have a preliminary use which is in solidarity. You come out and identify yourself. Say, okay, we're all here. We're willing to stand up and be identified so there's a tiny bit of risk involved in there because it can be a lot worse. I mean, there's, as we all know, there have been demonstrations that have been mowed down. But that wasn't going to happen in the Philippines. Um, and mainly, whether you get mowed down or not is the point of here we are all together. We're wear wearing yellow T-shirts. And from this, we can then go on to organize more concrete steps. My complaint with the contemporary peace movement in this country is that it's stuck in step one. That's my, my big complaint with them, not with you. So we don't need to go into that any further here. Now, if you remember, there was another person who was asked, why are you jogging? He was an older man. They asked him first. He had a bit more of an accent. Do you remember what he said? Yes. I, I really love this guy. He said, ha, 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 this is Philippine style. <laughs> 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 and then, then they asked him, is this all that you've got? He said, no, we have other things, but we're not going to tell you until later, which raises another point also. But the Philippine style point, don't let it just slip by. It's extremely important. You may also have noticed that Professor Arriaga in Chile, he said, we think this is the real Chile. Similarly, a friend of mine uh, whose name I can't pronounce, he's Polish, <laughs> uh, was in the Solidarity Uprising. And it was, uh, it was not fun. People were being very seriously beaten up, disappeared into prisons. And they were asked, why don't you fight back with weapons? He said, because we are Polish. So this, there's something very interesting that these people are getting at here. Historically, the Poles had one military uprising after another. Go down through the, the, the first period of time when there's an entity that you can call Poland. It included Lithuania and a couple of other places. They were against the Swedes, boo, <laughs> against the Russians, against all these occupiers. They had risen up. Every other generation lost a vast swath of their male population in these military uprisings. And yet, the first time you have a Polish uprising, Marek, my friend, Marek Zaleskiewicz actually is his name, said this, we did it because we were Poles. Isn't that interesting? Here you've been doing nothing but using violence for 500 years. You get to use nonviolence once and you say, this is who we are. Now, my point in all of this is that as Gandhi said, just as violence is the law of the brute, you know, um, we had one bobcat on our property and two weeks later we had no more quail. Because of the young quail had disappeared inside the bobcat <laughs> and the adults had hightailed it off to somebody else's property. So that's how nature works. I mean, you're not – nothing wrong with that if you're a bobcat. Mountain lion. But he said, just as violence is the law of the brute, nonviolence is the law of the human species. Now, these people, I think, are partially discovering that through their national identity. This is Philippine style. We're very proud of it. This is Polish. We're very proud of it. This is how Chile is supposed to be. 
We're very proud of it. And I, I'm making a big fuss about this. Uh, well, this is the kind of thing that I always make a big fuss about. But also I think because it's a very important source of power. Source of power. Remember that line from Shakespeare's King Lear where Edward says, I never yet was valiant where I was not honest. If you cannot be integral with yourself and be who you think you are, live up to your image of who you are, you, you lose power. If you can get hold of that, this is what the word yoga actually means, integrating all the elements of yourself, being completely honest. You get so much power that nobody can really stand up to that. Okay. So, I uh, couldn't resist. I, I want to draw our attention to another one, another category. We can continue this next time. Institutions that grow out of this. Um, you had the base communities in both the Philippine and the Chilean case and something very interesting in the Philippines. Okay, um, if we talk about players in the Philippines, we would have to point out that that uprising was not two-sided. It is not good guys against bad guys. Only in cowboy movies and in military logic does the world take these two very simple polar forms. In the real world, there's always more than two players. And Johann Galtung has said it's uh, usually around 15 or 17 different actors in any conflict that he's been involved with. But in the Philippines, you saw this very clear triangulation between the government – or among – the government, the uh, armed guerrillas, and the nonviolent uprising, the people power uprising. And there can be a very uncomfortable relationship between the nonviolent uprising and the armed uprising. It can be very uncomfortable. I went through this myself a little bit in the free speech movement and I have to say it is yucky. People who are, you think they're on the same page with you but they're coming from a different universe and they ended up on the same page. It can be really, really awkward. And so you had these villages. I know a young woman who lived in a village where – about half of the village had been wiped out and of that half, half had been wiped out by the Philippine army and half had been wiped out by the communist guerrillas. So they're going back and forth and it's the people who always get it. And the, the same thing all over Central America. Kill the peasants and then you know you're doing the right thing. And so what did they do? They formed a peace community which is an extremely uh, hopeful – kind of thing and it's playing a very important role in Colombia and other parts of Central America where you just draw a line and you say inside this community there is no violence. I don't care who you are. You know, nobody can bring guns in here. And when we talk about uh, Colombia, I hope we'll get to talk about that. We'll talk about a famous one called San Jose de Apartado. But you can see how important this could be because if they get the guerrillas to lay down their arms or if they get the government out of power, and this is the nucleus of the new society. Yeah, did you? Um, yes. Yes. You, did you mean Richmond? Yeah, yeah, yeah Richmond. Richmond yeah. Yeah, and we might have some people actually coming in here setting up their tents and telling us how those communities work, right? But these are a little bit more intense because they're actually in a hub of armed violence uh, and killings from both sides. Uh, the, the violence is a little more complicated in Richmond. <laughs> it's not any less worse, but it's, it's more complicated. So yeah, there are, in fact, there are about – whoa, there's no more time. There are about 54 of these communities in Colombia alone. So, okay, this is a good example of how we can start analyzing this stuff. Next time, let's start with your notes from that documentary and then go on to the second and third section from the Zunis Kurt Sinatra book. Great. Have a good weekend.